Hello and welcome to another episode of the Haskin Cast podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, and I am here with a very dear friend of mine who I've been wanting to interview for a long time. We're finally getting to it. Let's welcome from writing with Coach McCoach, Katie McCoach. Katie, how are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. You were actually one of the first names that I wrote down of people I would want to get to in here, like on year six, I'm finally getting a chance to interview you. I, wow. I am so excited because I remember when you first told me that you were going to start this business and you were right. so nervous and so excited at the same time. Looking back, oh, because this had to have been 2014? No, it was earlier than that. It was, was it? yeah, I went to LA in 2012. So I think probably I started the business in 2012. And so it must have been around then. Yeah. Wow. It, yeah. it, that's because I left Bank of America in 2014 and moved to LA. Yeah. I and it had been that long. Yeah. Well, I, I had a part-time job, um, from 2012 to 2014. I, I also, when I moved to LA, I transferred from Bank of America. Um, mm. uh, but I was really ready to get out of the short sales as soon as freaking possible. Right. So <laughs> I made that happen. I think at one point I had like three jobs, um, Bank of America full-time, drove an hour each way, worked for another job part-time from home, and then my own stuff I was starting. And then luckily I was able to quit Bank of America, had that other job, and I worked with authors, which was nice because it got me in there. Um, but yeah, 2014 was when I like officially like quit everything and was like, okay, just KM editorial. And it's still alive. So I love, it. <laughs> I, I love when people start something from that passion because there's people that start businesses because they think, oh, I think this will be successful and I think I can be good at it versus people who really enjoy doing something and turn it into a business. Mm -hmm. What made you, because you're a writer, but what made you start editing other people's work? Yeah. Um, you know, I studied creative writing in college. So I have a degree in creative writing, which <laughs> cool. Um, I also have it in uh, communication. So I ended up getting a double bachelor's um, because I was like, what am I doing with this writing degree? And to be honest, in uh, I went to Arizona State mm -hmm. and I, I feel like the writing degree, they were just like prepping me so I could continue to keep going to school for writing. So that kind of felt like all I was getting. Um, and I didn't want to, I was like, I'm never teaching. That's terrible. I'll never be a teacher, which we'll get into how that's ironic. But um, <laughs> uh, I was just like, no, I'll never teach. But I still wanted to be in writing somehow. And I was determined to make use of that degree and to make money in the writing field in some way. Like I knew my career had to be dealing with writing in some way, mm -hmm. really wanted to be with books. Um, so I worked my butt off to try and do that. I really liked, I found that as much as I enjoyed writing my own stuff, um, college was when I first was introduced to the, like a lot more of the workshop, like intense workshopping with other people. And so I found that I really enjoyed helping all the other people in class with their books. <laughs> and I liked giving them my insight and I struggled with, you know, doing some of my own and revisions and stuff. Um, I just really had more fun kind of laying into other people um, nicely. And, uh, and then I started doing a bunch of internships that kind of involved that. And I did different things like a lit mag at ASU. And then I worked with a small publishing house. I worked at a lit agency and I realized I didn't like the, uh, the sales aspect, but I realized what I did really like was seeing a book and being like, Ooh, that has it, whatever it is. Um, or I would see the book and I'd be like, Oh, I see all the potential. Like, let's keep going. And the agent's like, no, I, I take it at, when it's done. And I'm mm -hmm. like, well, I want to help get it there. So that is essentially how I realized I wanted to help do the editing. And then real quick, the other pieces that as I left college and started to figure out like, what does the book world look like? How do you get published? Um, you realize that typically the traditional path is that you pitch your book to an agent and then the agent sells it to an acquiring editor at a publishing house. So like say HarperCollins, 
there's an editor who buys your book. And what I found was that the people who were the acquiring editors that was closest to what I wanted to do, they got to work with the book, make it better. But they also, I, I learned through, I try to connect with everyone I could to learn about the industry and jobs. And I found that people were burnt out and that was 10 years ago and they were burnt out because the acquiring editors, most of their job was doing the production and the contracts and getting the book like ready to go and the actual editing they were doing in their free time. And I was like, I don't know. Thank you. Like I want to do the editing as my whole job. That's what I want to do. Um, so that's kind of how it started. And then I just, I was like, okay, let me do it myself. I have, I look back and I'm like, how did I, how did I start doing that? That was before, you know, in 2020, everyone learned what it's like to work from home, mm -hmm. but this was 2012. I was 23, 24. Oh my God. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm 33 now. So, um, that was, you know, and I just moved to LA, like I'm young. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like determined to have a job that is not short sales. And, um, I did get lucky. I think what happened is I went to a networking event in LA early on and a gal, um, I just kind of said, I do editing. I think I was kind of like testing the waters mm -hmm. and she's like, Oh, I'll hire you. And that was my first client. And then I realized I could do this. And then I just put everything into it to make it happen. I guess. Wow. And and I say on the show all the time, like, I love when things happen organically like that. You yeah. know, you, you, you have to do the things that make it align though, right? Like you have to go yeah. out and meet people to be able to yeah. find people to edit their projects. Yeah. But what concerns me is, is you said that, um, you know, they're editing in their spare time. So you have to wonder what is the quality of the edits that they're getting? Because it's like, I, I've got a half an hour before I have to start dinner or before, you know, we have to go out to, to the family's house or whatever. And you, they're, they're editing in chunks. They're rushing, you know, to get a, a piece done. And you have to wonder what is the quality that the client is getting when they're not able to just be dedicated to my job is to make this book as good as it can possibly be. <laughs> How have I never actually thought that? I've never thought about that before. I think because I've always looked at it like where I think any of us in this industry, we were so passionate about the books and we want to see them succeed so badly so I've always been like oh well they must they are determined to make this book as great as possible right but you're right I mean you really can't give it everything and I think everyone faces burnout too so then of course you have to deal with that and imagine burnout on trying to edit a book on top of all the other things you actually have to do during your day I mean yeah, yeah and it's that's wild. Even even just to be able to concentrate on it and know the characters and understand their development and their character arcs and then the arc of the overall story. And like, there's so many things that get woven together in a book. It's a lot to keep track of. Mm -hmm. And that's how I started doing continuity was because I started catching when I was doing audiobooks, I started mm -hmm. catching things that didn't make sense. Yeah. Like something would happen on page five and by page 93, I'm like, that completely contradicts, but the right. story didn't grow. So right. that would have worked, you know? And I think it's, it's again, you fall into those things naturally because they're, they're skills that you have, but as an editor, and, and I know you, you're such a sweet person. You're so kind and, and thoughtful. And when, when you told me you were editing, the, the question I had was, how do you deliver feedback? Because you have to be as an editor at times, you could be friendly, but you can also have to be direct and harsh at sometimes, uh, you know, to, to get your point across. How do you manage like your personality with having to be an editor? You know, uh, I will do a humble brag. Maybe it's humble. Maybe not that I will say this. This is actually one of my things that I really love about the way I do it is that um, I really, really work on being encouraging. And so when I first started, um, when I first started editing, I started as I called myself a developmental editor, which I still am. Um, but now it's expanded into book coaching. But as developmental editor, what you'll typically find is that the editor will read through your book. They will write up a report, like essentially a critique report of however many pages with all their feedback, and then also go through and make marks on the book and maybe um, like add comments or edits itself. So when I started, I would do all of this and their critique report 
who was hefty. Um, and I think I, I have to give credit to my communications degree because I mean, obviously I had to write a bunch of reports and I think it's weird that I ended up deciding to do a job where I would make myself do reports all the time. Eventually, as you can imagine, I did get a little burnt out. So I actually do not re provide uh, written feedback anymore. Oh. But I can, yeah, I actually only do um, video coaching now. So wow. instead of putting the edits in the whole book and writing up, because I would write like 10 to 15 pages a book. Um, instead of doing that now, actually, I read the book and then I get on like a 90 minute Zoom call. And I will get into like, the, it's so much more rewarding. But with those reports, when I first would start, you know, it, what, it honestly, it's like a compliment sandwich. <laughs> you do have to work on that a little bit. Like I, you did all of this really well. Here's what I saw. And the thing about book editing for developmental editing, editing specifically, because that's really the content it's copy editing is when you're doing grammar, punctuation, continuity, and things like that. Developmental editing is more about the story, the characters, do things make sense? Mm -hmm. Is this readable? <laughs> is it enjoyable? And also where can I give you some techniques to do stronger writing, right? Um, and to evoke more emotion, anything. So with my edits, what I, what I would normally do in my report is kind of you did this really well. And then it would be kind of like, I see what you're trying to do. Like, I see your vision. Here's ways I think you can get there. Um, here are some inconsistencies with the character or the plot or things that, you know, maybe the character is a little t 2D. I might not say that, but I would give tips on how to strengthen them and make them deeper. Um, and then I would also provide like writing tips. Like, here are some things that I recommend you look into more. Here, here's some stuff you need to know. Like, show don't tell you know like it's a very common we've all heard show don't tell in writing um and so i would always kind of like okay here's how it would come out in your writing here are ways you can do it but so i would and then all my stuff would be as encouraging as possible like not like trying to be too nice mm -hmm. but i don't think there's any benefit to telling someone this is trash start over yeah. um I'm just not that person who's going to, I, there are, they're already so hard to get edits in the first place to get 10 pages of notes telling you what to change on your book or fix is already so much that all I want to do is just keep seeing the person actually apply it and work on it. Um, so then I worked really hard at like not sounding like a jerk, um, but to stay long winded. Um, that's eventually, that's exactly actually why I started moving away from the reports, mm -hmm. because what I would find is I'd write up this report and then maybe someone was used to getting feedback. So they'd be like, okay, I can take it and go. Sometimes it would stall someone because they would be like, holy cow, I just got 15 pages of notes. What, do, what, like, I don't, this is too much. Mm -hmm. I've definitely had people who I try so hard to be nice. Uh, I read a blog post after one person. I didn't know they posted. It. Eventually I saw it. She cried for like days after I'm like, oh my God, I was trying so hard not to do that. But that's what happens if you get 15 pages of notes. I get super weird about, I've had feedback come to me and every time it feels very personal and it's hard to distance myself no matter how nice it is. Yeah. So after a while, I really didn't like the fact that they were just getting it and then being hit with a whole bunch at once. And that was kind of the end. Like there wasn't, we could have conversations later, but it was me expressing what I found and them just having to take it. So that's how um, now I'm at the point where I feel, luckily I feel comfortable that I can get on a call. I used to not obviously, but yeah. now I can get on a Zoom call and be like, okay, let's talk about your book. And it's been so much nicer. We record the calls. They can always go back to it. But then that's why I'm able to be like, well, this is what I found. This is what I think your vision is. Am I right? And then we work on how to get it there together. It's almost like a strategy session at this point. Like it's mm -hmm. a manuscript strategy session. 
I really love this method and, and for a lot of reasons, because one, you're right. I mean, getting a file that's, you know, like my, my editor would, my, my first editor that I was working with, she, we would do a chapter at a time. So I had to break the books into individual yeah. chapter files. I would send those, she would send me that chapter back with the notes. Yeah. So it was, it was smaller chunks of you did yeah. this wrong. So, but they were still <laughs> hard to read, but but right. a little more manageable. Right. My other editor would just t- took the whole book file and would just add to her notes as she had time to. So I would get like six or seven chapters at a time. And um, it is the most just daunting thing to see. Just You just scroll down and you see all these comments because she used the uh, <laughs> annotations on the yes. right. Yes, the word track changes, the annotations. And you're just like, you scroll through these, you know, okay, tomorrow, I'll look at this tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> like, like you, it's And then so you start annoying. you start hating your own project yeah. because there's all these things. And, and then yeah. it's like, you make one change, but how did that affect... Mm-hmm. Other things that that weren't that the that the editor didn't know about yet because they haven't right. gotten that far, but it affects something that happens in the future. Right. Yeah, it's so much to balance. But as somebody who's given notes as a proofreader, and sometimes yeah. I'll see things that don't that that seem like you know this I I'm not understanding this about the character, right. so I was throwing those notes. Yeah, and you're like I don't know as the author, if you're accepting my feedback, I don't know if I'm mm-hmm. talking to the wind. I don't know if you're changing anything, which might affect what I'm reading later. Yeah. Um, so I love that direct interaction because yeah. you get more of an understanding of what they're probably going to change, what they're not receptive to. And you're really working with them in the development as opposed to just passing ideas back and forth without knowing what's going on. That makes a big difference. It's been really nice. It's, um, I mean, I could be, I really don't think I'm exaggerating when I say, I'm trying to think if there's anyone every time after one of these calls now, because I've been doing, I started it, I started transitioning to this. I think it was 2020. I started it out and now it's like, this is the main thing I do. I I actually just sent off the very last line that edit I will ever do. I'm no longer providing line edits because they're so time consuming. I just don't have the time in me. I mean, on average, it would take 30 hours a book. Can you imagine? I, and there's no way people are getting paid enough for 30 hours. Right. Yeah. Right? yeah. So um, it was really time consuming. And um, also like, I, I just, I'm more in a phase of like, like I said earlier, ironic that I never wanted to teach because I am all the time. That's all I do. <laughs> I well, am constantly but, teaching. But there's a difference between being an instructor yeah. You know, having having a class with a syllabus yeah. and I have to teach the same thing over and over. You're getting a very personal experience yourself because each author is individual and they have their own style, but they're also writing different stories. And as yes. a professor, you you might get papers to read, but you're not going to get a real interactive and because you're really working as a creative more than here's oh, yeah. the thing I have to teach and here's what the state says I have to teach and all that. It's a oh, whole gosh. different, you're, that you're would teaching be without, te- without instructing, I think. Yeah. yeah. But then I also am teaching now too, a lot. So, um, and I'm creating a course. Um, so I'm, because as much as it is for each person, it's personal and we talk about, so in these conversations, I'll talk about their story and like, I see where you're going. Um, xyz like and then let's brainstorm and figure it out and it's oh it's so fun it's so rewarding and i would say every time the person walks away and they're like i know exactly what i'm doing that session was fun i can't wait to start next Mm -hmm. i'm ready to revise which is for me like the biggest thing if they actually want to go back into their work to make changes it's huge because i feel like that is such a hill to climb Um, but then there's, but then I do find that I repeat myself quite a bit, you know? So Mm -hmm. there's, um, there's certain concepts now, um, that I teach a lot and I'm building courses around certain things that I'm constantly teaching. And then I do send a report to some, it is not personalized, but it is a, here are all the writing techniques. (laughs) is everything I want you to know. You can go and do more work on it. I'll tell you out of these, these are the ones I really think you should focus on because in those 10, 15 page of critique reports, I kept saying like the same thing about certain techniques. And so finally I was like, okay, here's my standard set of here are techniques you need to know. These are the ones that super 
doesn't apply to you. <laughs> here are the ones you're really good at, you know, and which I think is also important, which is something I also include is I always talk about, oh, you did this well, your strength that lies here because a lot of times writers look at feedback and they're like, I don't know, well, what am I supposed to change? Should I change everything? Is anything worth sticking with? So it's also important that they know where their strengths are so they know what not to F with, you know? <laughs> I think I, I think it's great to have that that balance too of of positive. I, I mean, to me, it's all positive feedback. Anything that helps it you is. improve. Oh, yeah, Some yeah. positive feedback is just harder to listen to than other yeah. positive feedback. But I, I think that's really important too because it gives them a hey, I'm not just sucking at this. I thought right. I had a cool idea. I thought I could be an author because I think that's what stops a lot of people from even finishing the first draft. Hundred percent. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's also nice too because. Um, by having the conversation too, I'm not just kind of saying, well, I think your book, so maybe someone sends me something that uh, has teen characters, but they're like, it's adult. And I'm like, well, I think it's YA. Mm -hmm. And instead of me just writing a report and being like, <clears throat> I think it's this, and here are the ways you can do that. And they're the whole time, like, well, I don't want it to be that. And they're just now they're just fighting against anything I've said because they're like, well, they didn't see what I wanted to do. Right. So instead of that, now I can have the conversation and say, OK, here's what I gathered from your book. What is I want to make sure our visions are aligned so that I can help you meet your goals or here's the reality check. What do you want to do from here? And then I can tailor my advice to be like, oh, OK, if you want to do that, then you go in this direction, which is also really nice, too. I think. For me, I learned uh, through doing film scoring and doing music for licensing that uh, when you're not writing for yourself, you know, you have to tailor it to what your client wants. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you're writing something for and, and and but in the beginning, you think you're writing what you want and they should just oh. accept it and getting that <laughs> this isn't what I'm looking for. This doesn't fit. Um, that kind of feedback was in the beginning really hard to take because there's that balance of but I'm the artist and this is, you're not getting what I'm going for. Is that a, is that a big uh, th challenge for you is trying to get the, the authors to understand the difference between, yes, this is your artistic vision, but for it to work or for it to really make sense, here's, here's what would help. Yeah, I would say um, on your point of like, there would be times, I think earlier on when I'd be like, I, I was always I always worked on this, but essentially that feeling of, oh, this is what I would do, which I think is um, a difficult thing that a lot of writers face when they deal with uh, sometimes critique partners. It's great to have critique partners, but sometimes they get in a situation where the critique group or partner will say, well, they'll give advice that's like what they would want to do. And it's not, you can't do that. It's about the author and what they right. want. And so there are many times where um, I, I just have to take myself out completely. I mean, I just remove myself um, and I give my insight and sometimes I'll give even like a lot of times when I did the line edits, I mean, I would write in sentences for them, but it would be very much trying to match their style and what works for them. But yes, yeah, so there are a lot of times where um, someone that's that's kind of why I kind of I like to gauge where they are and what their plan was to make sure that I have the vision that they intended because that's the piece of it that's hard with writing is an author will have something in their head but then what's on the page might not be the same so I really work to like analyze everything I see and be like okay well I'm pretty sure this is what you actually meant to do mm -hmm. I can see all that I see the pieces there um but a reader isn't going to get there so here's what we can do for that but um usually I'm there to be able to work with someone and be like you know what I you know what did you want to do okay if that's really not going to work and your goal is to do like say their goal is to pitch an agent, get an agent and get a traditional publisher. But they wrote something that's super, super niche. I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> here's maybe how you might be able to, or maybe there's a different path that might work for you. You know, not everything's going to be, everything will have a different path, I feel like. And so sometimes it's a matter of, do you want to hold on to your vision or do you want to go this other route? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not like I'm ever like, get rid of your vision, but hey, if you really want to make a goal of selling or you really want to make money with your book then you might have to go on a different strategy you know 
So almost like the difference of here's how you can be an artist and put out your artistic vision, or here's how you can twist it to have your artistic vision become commercially potentially successful. Yeah. And all are valid. Like mm -hmm. it's totally all valid, whatever you want to do. You know, if your goal is I want to make money as a writer, well, then you're going to have to consider a few things and you are writing to the market a little more. Right. And then if your goal is like, I need to publish the book of my heart and I want to control all aspects of it. Well, then self-publishing is probably better because then you're able to make all the decisions in the end. Right. So it's all up to, that's why it's, it's so, that's an essential part of the conversation I have usually before we work together. Mm -hmm. So when I first meet someone, um, I'll get on it we'll talk for 20 minutes or so, and then I can give them direction where to go, whatever type of thing we're going to do together. But that at least gives me a heads up of, okay, with their goal in mind, now I'm going to read the book. How do we get to that goal, you know, with what they have? And so that that's part of the conversation for sure. Cause that's, I mean, their career is the whole point. A lot of people are like, oh, I just want to write, I want to write a book. But once they do that, then it's like, well, where do you go from there? What do you want next? Yeah. You know, what do you yeah. want to do with it? Right. You know, and I'm sure you, you've had the same question you've asked yourself. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, you know, what's, what good is a piece of, of art if no one can experience it? You know, if you, if you yeah. paint something, you just keep it in the garage and no one ever sees it. Yeah. I mean, great that you did it, but right. I'm sure there's somebody out there that could enjoy it. Yeah, you know? exactly. Uh, you talked about book groups. Um, I, I don't know that I've ever known anyone that's actually enjoyed being a part of a book group. It <laughs> seems like it usually ends up with uh, somebody has an attitude or there was an argument over this or that. Yeah. It it seems to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, from your position, it seems like you almost need to review the book as a reader, more so than as the technical aspects of being a writer. You can you can look back on it and go, okay, here's how I think you could fix it. But when you're first experiencing it, you need to read it as a customer or a potential reader would. Mm -hmm. I think that's the difference because you're right. Yeah. Authors will say, here's what I would do with it, or I would go yeah, in this direction because exactly. that's my style, not right. here's what I think would help you with your style. Right. I have, I have thoughts on these things. So first of all, um, yes, I do go into it like, okay, I put myself in the shoes of the writer a re or the reader, a reader who is able to articulate why they're bothered by something so I am looking at it like well as the reader I would be upset with this character doing this or this doesn't make sense to me and then as the editor I'm able to say here's why these are the things that you did earlier on that set it up that we need to work on because that's where the reader is going to get upset or caught up so the reader might be like this doesn't make sense or I hate this character or I don't give a crap about how this ends and so as an editor I'm able to go deeper and be like okay here are all the pieces the layers to that this is what you need to do to, to satisfy your reader so it's kind of it's taking both um whereas you know if you just had a someone who reads a lot but doesn't necessarily you know provide editorial advice um they're they're able to give their opinion like this is how I feel which is super important because readers are the whole point but um they might not be able to articulate it. Whereas then a writer, if you work with a critique group and someone else who also writes, they're all, they're going to be also working on analyzing it, um, which can be helpful, but also can be distracting. It can distract you from the goal. So then my other thought on this is, so I've been in many critique groups and um they're, they're tough. They're not easy. I mean, it started with in uh, college, you know, workshops, our classes were literally workshops. All we did was each person, a couple people came every week and we just critiqued everyone. And the person just sat there quietly while everyone threw a bunch of thoughts at them and you couldn't say anything. There's no response. And you just had to take it. Wow. Um, and it was really hard. And that's like the standard way I think of critiquing in a lot of spaces it's and, almost like one of those gang initiation things where everybody yeah. just gets to punch you and you just have right? to take You're it for 10 like, minutes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And it's hard, especially if you're not familiar or you haven't done it before and you get feedback like that. And you're like, well, if everyone says I should do this, I guess I should do this. And it's hard to find your voice of like, no, but my goal is this. But they're saying this. 
how do I reach my goal? It's like, what's not connecting? That's what I, that's my superpower, I guess, is that I'm able to take that and say, this is what people are getting. This is what you intended. Here's how we bridge it. But if you are just entering critique group, I mean, I I experienced it myself where people give feedback and you're just sitting and you're like, okay, I guess that's what they're getting from it. And so I had one time where I had a story, got a ton of feedback. I ended up because I just, I was, I didn't know what to do. I ended up tailoring my, my revised it to what everyone was saying. Mm. Everyone gave feedback and I revised it to them. And when I came back the next time, I hated it. I really, really did not like the story. It wasn't like anything like my original vision. And everyone felt that too. So the next time some people might've liked it, but for the most part, it was this, uh, no, you're not hitting the mark. And so the next time I finally said, okay, well, F everything, like I'm just ignoring it. Um, I'm going to take what sort of connected to me and then write it again. Mm -hmm. And I did that in that time because I actually finally picked through the advice. That third one, when I took that in that revision, I remember someone being like, oh, this is what you meant to do the first time. It's like, yes, <laughs> this was the original, like this, I, I finally bridged it together. But I think a lot of people fall prey to critique groups and criticism and think, oh, well, I have to do what they say. Um, or if people think that, then I guess that's what I should do. And you, it's really tough, but you have to build up an ability to um, take and receive criticism, which is yeah. super essential. Um, I think it's really important. Critiques groups can be really helpful, but they can also be a little detrimental at times. Um, I've created a way to deal with that. Good. <laughs> well, about it. <laughs> but I think too, a lot of times when you go back and, and you say, okay, I made these modifications and people yeah. like, okay, I like the story now. Well, did you like it because you like the change or did you like it because yeah. I did what you said I should do? Right. So, you really don't know where that feedback is coming from. Yeah. And, it, but if you, if you aren't connected to your own story anymore, if you've changed it to where it's, it's not the story you told, it's not your vision, you don't like the characters, then what's the point of continuing with it? Because exactly. in the end, you're going to hate your own project. You're going to be like, why did I bother with this? And, you know, with writing a book, as you know, you're going to spend a lot of time with that book. So if you hate it, then it's, yeah you're going to be miserable. And then the, your readers feel it, you know, even if you have a scene, you're like, oh, I didn't really like writing that scene. Your readers will feel it. They're not going to like that scene either. Mm -hmm. I mean, there have been times when I had a, I was in a critique group and we would read our work out loud, which I think was helpful because you would notice where you're bored <laughs> with right. your own work. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I'm, I'm 13 years before I'm releasing my book. So I'm definitely to the point where I'm like, if, if I read yeah. one more, if I read it one more time, I'm just going to burn it. It's like, right. I've been through this so many times, you know, yes. um, at what point should somebody reach out to you? Because should they start before they start the book? Should they start once they have a draft? Where, where do you come into the picture? You know, it's funny when I started my, uh, my response to this was very different when I started as a developmental editor and what you'll hear from a lot of people who also do this is they'll be like, come to me at the very end. Like after you've taken it as far as you can, after you've gotten critique feedback, after you've had people read it, they're called beta readers who will read it um, ahead of time to let you know. Some people call them alpha readers who are essentially, in my opinion, critique partners um, in a way. And those are people who give, you know, a little more tailored feedback than just someone who is maybe a typical reader. And so do as much as you can ahead of time, take it as far as you can, work out all the kinks that you think you can do, and then come to me because then I want to see the best version and work with you from there. So that used to be my response. Mm -hmm. And a lot of editor, developmental editors will probably say the same. At this point now, since I work so much in this coaching um, aspect, and I really my goal is really how do you make the best story? Not necessarily how do you make the best writing, but how can we make sure your story is so good that it wouldn't matter if your writing sucked? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is my goal. And then of course, then, then we work on the writing, but there's no point in dealing with the writing if your story isn't there. So now at this point, I do feel like 
people can come to me for the most part at any point. Um, I mean, I have people who, I'm, I mean, I do uh, plot your book days. I, I do mm -hmm. VIP days actually where um, we spend a whole day together on Zoom, like six hours and we plot a book from start to finish. Wow. So I have that, which is so fun. Um, I've done a few of them and it is like the most fun I've ever had. I end a whole work day and I am like, I could do a whole nother day of like anything right now because it's just so much fun just spending. I mean, imagine just spending six hours and someone's like, okay, we're going to get your book together and we're only going to talk about your book and we're going to go through every scenario. So uh, obviously I send them prep work ahead of time. So that's, I do that. I'll, I'll be in the very beginning. I've worked with some memoir writers for just coaching where they're like, I want to write a book. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> here are some exercises. Let's get started. <laughs> um, so I've worked where there's nothing. And then most of the time I work on usually like a couple drafts in. So someone will have a book that they've worked on a little bit on their own. And then they're kind of at the point where they're like, what, what do I do? I know something's missing. I know it's not there. I just can't put my finger on it. And that's usually most often when I come in and then we work on getting that story where they want. And then I just tend to naturally do now that I do coaching, I tend to also be like, okay, well, what are your goals for the future and how do we get you there? So it leads into usually a little more than just one session, um, which is more fun too, because then I get to see them through their career. Yeah. So that's pretty neat too. Yeah. Well, and you also get to see the benefit of your effort, right? Because you mm -hmm. see how the things the that you've result. done. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That that's probably a, a huge fun. that would be huge for me. And I think that's yeah. probably why that uh plot day works so well because yes. you're you're watching it develop from a blank canvas to a, a sketch of a picture right before your eyes. And yeah. it said, oh, oh, wait, oh, you, okay, here's yeah. what we could do. You know, and you have those <laughs> excitement moments yeah. where you're like, maybe they find a treasure map or, yeah. or you know, whatever it's going to be. Um, before we wrap up, I want to talk to you about your podcast because you've just uh, added a podcast to mm -hmm. your uh, list of amazing things that you do. Yes. I love this show because it's very... Um, it's very just natural and relaxed. And I feel like, and this is the best part for me because I listen to a lot of podcasts. I feel like we're having a conversation that I'm just not a part of, mm -hmm. you know, like, like we're like, I'm just chatting back and forth, but I'm not saying anything. And it's mm -hmm. very relaxed and casual, but so informative yet informal. And I think that's what I like about it. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> how, how did you, what made you start doing the podcast? You know, I, I find that I've been over the past few years, as I go into more coaching, um, I find that I'm teaching more. I started actually um, to kind of go backwards a little. I actually started a group where it's called Author Growth Corner. And so what we do is it's a group of authors. I mean, anyone can join. Um, and I teach a class. I teach one class in the beginning of the month. And then later in the month, we do a live critique group because I found that they're so terrible sometimes I was like okay well what if it's led by a book coach who can keep it on track and also everyone can learn by hearing my thoughts um so they get to learn from a book coach in that sort of professional manner but also there are there is opportunity for peer feedback but also I'm kind of there to make sure that it stays on track <laughs> mm -hmm. and I can I can also adjust if there's someone like oh well I would do this I'd be like wait a minute <laughs> um that hasn't happened yet luckily but um so then I started doing that. So I do that monthly. Um, and then I get to talk to those people all the time. I started a Facebook group where I talked to people and I was talking to them weekly. And I teach, I teach text-based classes. I teach presentations. And so I'm just, I'm always kind of find myself in these different avenues. And as much as I love, I actually really love when I'm talking, uh, I do live teachings and I get to have that immediate feedback to see what people are asking as much as I love it I found that sometimes I'm like well I just want to I just want to kind of rattle on and give my advice and uh <laughs> just lay into people a little bit without actually anyone feeling like I'm direct at them and the other piece too is as I've been doing more one-on-one -on -one coaching with clients um there are a lot of things I feel like we're working through with mindset stuff and it's funny because I feel like uh, I'm starting to take like learn from life coaches. I'm like listening to life coaching podcasts and other things like that because I feel like so much of that applies to writing because it's so like deeply a part of someone's life. So I feel like I'm constantly 
working through mindset things or I'm giving writers permission. So I kept thinking, oh, I just feel like I'm always telling someone, yeah, you know, you're allowed to do this, right? And it'll, I don't know, for some reason, someone telling them they have permission to do something opens everything up. And so I kind of wanted to move that to the podcast to be able to reach more people at once to say, you know, you can do this, or why don't you just ignore all this advice? Or, you know, even, and I don't know if you noticed, but even on my podcast, I've said like, you know, here is what I would do, but like, ignore me if you want to, like, you Mm -hmm. don't have to take my advice because writers are, I feel like notorious for thinking they have to do everything they hear. And or they go so far on the other side, they're like, I'm going to break every rule. I'm like, well, <laughs> let's try to meet in the middle a little bit. Like, yeah, also not going to help. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. maybe break the rules after you know the rules well, um, but also don't feel like you have to listen to every single rule ever, you know? But I think I think you're right. And I do notice that a lot more with authors than I would say musicians or, you know, maybe uh, mm-hmm. actors. But I think we all as artists t- tend to have that. I don't know if it's a fear of success and we just put these little blocks in front of ourselves so that we don't allow ourselves to be successful, but there, there is that element of, oh, I didn't realize it was okay for me to just audition for anything I wanted or, you know, we, we have to understand that we don't have restrictions unless we put them on ourselves. You know, like there, there is not a wall that prevents us from doing anything except that maybe we don't know how to, how to walk through the door. Mm -hmm. but there's nothing that says we can't exactly but like sometimes people just need to be told (laughs) exactly and me too and I think the other reason I started the podcast too is um it's almost like it's what I I dish what I need to hear and I wish I could actually hear my own advice and take it um Mm -hmm. but since I'm not good at that I will give it to others and hope that it helps someone else and the nice thing has been that there have been I the when I first launched it like episode one and I had quite a few people who emailed and said this is exactly what I needed to hear today and it was just just so nice and especially because there were a few people who were like I haven't written in a while and I this helped me get back and Mm -hmm. that to me I just I just so much want to encourage writers. I feel like there's so many writers get stuck and don't follow through or they think like, who am I to be writing something or there's shame around it or their fear. They're afraid of actually getting their stuff out there, right? They're afraid of someone seeing it. Um, They're also simultaneously afraid of no one seeing it. And so trying to help those people feel like they can do it because yeah. My my big thing too is you can always grow. You can always get better. So if you're committed, just keep going and you'll be amazed at where you go and so I just want to give writers more of that empowerment, I guess. And you do. I I that's what I love about the show. I love that you're putting out great information, but I love that you're not like here's the textbook thing or here's yeah. what I'm supposed to tell you. It's just a very natural, friendly I'm just going to put my arm around you and we're going to chat kind of, kind of feel. (laughs) And I love that, you know, uh, I think that's exactly what we need. We need more honesty. There's too much that's let me, let me act like I'm, you know, a professor and I'm teaching you a course and there's just too much of that. We need that friendly. We're just going to have a chat kind of thing. You're just not going to say anything. (laughs) Just listen. (laughs) There you go. Uh, I love that you're doing this. I I remember when you first told me about this, I I remember very specifically, I remember where your desk was at the time. I remember (laughs) for some reason I came and sat on the back of your desk. I don't know why, but I I did that and you you turned around and you were talking to me and um, you told me about all this and I thought you would be so good because you had already read my screenplay version of my book. It was only like yeah. 14 pages at the time. Yes, uh, I, re- I know. I remember that. <laughs> and I, I remember how you left your feedback. It was very friendly, but very like, here's something you really need to consider kind of thing. And I thought you just have the right personality. But then I, I once I started like being a beta reader myself, I'm like, um, I'm really sorry to point this out. And you probably know way more about the English language than I do. But just, you know, if you get a chance, maybe oh, take yeah. a minute and double like a paragraph of why you shouldn't even listen to my, what I'm going to say. Right, right. Oh, just, just to tell them that I think they missed a comma. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, I'm, and I started thinking about it. I'm like, I wonder, because I know you personally, and, and we tend to get in a different gear when we're in a professional mode. Yeah. But just knowing how sweet you are personally, I'm like, I wonder how you're going to, 
approach things like that. Cause I think it, it takes a little bit for a person who's just generally nice to develop that directness and feel comfortable with it. Yeah. 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 I try really hard to just kind of compliment sandwich. I mean, and that's yeah. funny because yeah, I mean, that was a long time ago when we did that. And then I've also, I mean, I've worked with friends and family and they still, you know, I have one person who still every time is like you're gonna or some people who will be like you're gonna hate it or you're gonna judge me and I'm like I am not I am so not judgmental and all I want is if this matters to you then we're gonna make it so you just constantly keep getting better otherwise like then do something else with your life if you're gonna be filled fulfilled by something else go do something else yeah, but I if you're too yeah. filled with doubt, you're never going to like putting your book out. Even if people say that they like it, you're going to find an excuse to oh, not yeah. make it work. Oh, oh, you're just saying that because oh, you're my friend or, yeah. you know, you're, you're never going to be fulfilled by it unless you find a way to come to terms yeah. with those kind of things for sure. You always are going to get better. And, and it's same like with the podcast, part of the reason why I hadn't done it for so long was because I was afraid to have my voice out there mm -hmm. and I stutter. I say, um, all the time. I say so all the time. I just transcribed a class I did and every single thing started with so. <laughs> uh, but then I thought, you know, I have to put it out. If I can't encourage writers to start from scratch and work their way up and get better if I'm not going to just put my stuff out there when it's less than perfect too. And so, and even if I looked back at my very first edits, I mean, I would, I would never want to see those. <laughs> I, I would not want to see those edits from that long ago because I'm in such a different place, but that's so amazing. And it was great then. And then it just got better. Exactly. I did my prices. <laughs> Right. Accordingly, but sure. you know, but, but, but just, just as an author grows, I mean, we grow in the things that we do. Certainly if I were to go back and listen to the first episodes of my podcast, yeah. which I will refuse to do, yeah. um, it, I'm sure they were very rough and, you know, I've, I've gotten so used to doing them. I'm, I mean, I'm hitting 600 episodes of just my own yeah. podcast. It's like, if yeah. I don't have it down by now, <laughs> you know, but but there's still probably things I could improve on if I you know if I were to sit down and actually review it I'm sure yeah. there's things I could find to get better at so I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that it's just a matter of I think the thing that that works best with you is that it just feels relaxed and casual I don't feel like you're somebody who's going to judge and go your book isn't going to work or yeah. you know I wouldn't I wouldn't be afraid to come to you because I would be afraid of what you would say I would be afraid to come to you and go she's going to tell me everything that I didn't do right. And I'm afraid because I'm afraid there's a lot I didn't do right. Not because of you, because I, I know that you're somebody I would be comfortable getting that feedback from, but that would be more like my self-doubt, which is a big thing that, that we as creatives just have to get past if we ever want to get anywhere. We do. Well, and the other point to that would be like, if it were me getting feedback, I would not only be afraid for me to tell myself, all the things I missed or needed to still do. But then it would be the layer of once she tells me, I actually have to do it. That would, to me, would be the hardest part. <laughs> right. Th then there's a whole nother layer of responsibility yeah. oh, that now comes I have with to that. Follow through. Oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I would wait and wait. And then my editor would send me notes. I'm like, oh, great. I get to, oh, wait. Now I have to do something with those. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it, that's a tough thing for sure. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for coming on the show. Yeah, I'm so me. happy for you. I can't even tell you because I, when I think back to that day, and how excited you were and to see what you've turned this into. Mm -hmm. It's so been funny. such an amazing journey. You're helping a lot of people, which is to me, one of the greatest things that we can do with our time. Uh, I just love it. And uh, you're fantastic. I'm so grateful that we've been friends all these years. And mm -hmm. I just, I wish for your continued success. Well, same to you. And I can't wait to hear when your book comes out. So It's it's soon, <laughs> very yeah, soon. So uh, the, you, the, yeah. first, the first of the trilogy anyway. Uh, you guys can catch Katie's podcast on Apple Podcasts. I will have that link in the show notes. That's where I listen every week. And I will have links to her Facebook group, her Instagram, and all those good places that you can find her. Uh, check out her work. She's amazing, as you can tell. Thank you, Katie. We'll do this again. And uh, just keep doing what you do because you're doing awesome. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>